What's up and welcome back to Interpreting the Scares. <laughs> That's right, we're back out on our month-long journey throughout the nightmares. And now remember, this month we're taking a look at 31 foreign horror films in chronological order. Now yesterday, what did we do? We took a look at Juon the Curse. But today, we're taking a look at the direct sequel to that called Juon the Curse 2. And my oh my, is this a short, short, short film. Let's get cracking anyway. This film, for the most part, takes place immediately after the events that took place in the first movie following the Juwan curse as it spreads even deeper across the land from those in the real estate world to those in their families to the current residents of the house seen in the first movie. The film strives to prove just how dangerous the curse is and how, once it starts, there's just no escaping the wrath of Kayako. Side note to any screenwriter out there tasked with writing a script for a sequel, if the total runtime of your film is only 75 minutes long, that's already short. Please refrain from introducing your film by simply taking the last 30 minutes of the first film and using it as the introduction to this. That doesn't work. That just makes people double check if they're watching the right movie or not. But that's exactly, exactly how this film operates. My jaw was on the ground when I saw that. I mean, they didn't reshoot any of the scenes from different angles or with better cameras or add any kind of new material or anything. It literally is the last 30 minutes of the first Juon film as the first 30 minutes of this. For a movie that's already this insanely short, that's wasteful. I mean, it wasted the editor's time to include it, and it wasted the audience time that came to watch what they thought was a new movie. In a way, that was like the longest previously on I've ever seen in my entire life. After that, though, the movie is honestly great. It is. All 45 minutes of it. There's an increased eye for cinematography and making Kayako feel legitimately terrifying. There's just no escaping her, and that was definitely apparent here. Everything surrounding her feels so much like Samara or Sadako in the Ringu series, right down to freezing people in a scream of death. She's got she's got this long hair, she's got this walk to her that's really, really creepy, very much like Samara. It often feels closer to the ring than the Ringu series felt. Heck, before a lot of people die in this series, they get a phone call, a paranormal phone call, only instead of somebody saying, seven days, you get the sound of an aggravated feline growling. It is startling, I will say that. Now, I've always held the belief that the scares in this franchise are mostly just jump scares for no other reason than to be a jump scare. Now, while I still somewhat believe that since the places that Kayako shows up is really, really outlandish. But the more that you think about it in terms of what happens in your nightmares, it does kind of make sense. I mean, there's not a ton of logic behind nightmares, but the feeling of being surrounded by death or something terrifying that you can't get away from that shows up around every single corner, that's relatable to a lot of people. And because of that, I actually think that the scares in this film are pretty great. It felt very nightmarish in a way. So even though that there were jump scares, they didn't have the typical loud noises and bangs associated with them like they do here. In the US of A, <laughs> it was more about the atmosphere in this film and the feeling of no escape. And I think that that's really important to actually distinguish here. Now, I'm not convinced that the film needed to happen. I am glad that it did though, as it once again shows how quick a curse like this can spread. But yeah, the narrative, not very useful. It doesn't add a ton of stuff, but rather literally rehashes the first movie. So much so that I would say between the two movies, just watch the second, since it rehashes all the important stuff in the first anyway, right down to the scariest moments that happened in that movie. But technically, what they could have done, and probably should have done, is just connect the two movies into one normal length film because both movies are just a little bit over an hour long. This one alone is just 45 minutes when you get rid of all the stuff it rehashed. So just make one movie that's like an hour and 50 minutes long. What's wrong with you? I mean, they both came out the same year. I mean, why couldn't they do that? Anyways, as far as fear goes, I think that this is a pretty good film that has once again a pretty good utilization of scary things that happens and it's ultimately worth the watch even though reusing that last 30 minutes does seem pretty darn silly. Let's go ahead and break down my final score for a second which I rated Jew on the Curse 2 
a B minus letter grade, final overall score of 71%, 71 out of 100 possible stars. So overall, I would say that it's a pretty great score considering almost half of it was the same thing that you saw in the first. <laughs> but what about you guys? Have you seen Juwan the Cursed Two. If you have, what'd you think about it? And does the rest of the Juwan films do the same exact thing if you saw them? Let me know, because I feel like that would be incredibly annoying after time. I don't know. Only time will tell. As for YouTube, you guys know what to do. Hit the like, subscribe button, and bell to be notified when I come out with my next review for interpreting the scares. And until then, peace out.